Business has seen a lot of advantages using audio today. We know that we can use it for dictation. We use it for learning. We can adjust the speed. There's a lot more that we can do, but there's a problem too. We've got so much audio. How do you make sense of it all? Well, that's where artificial intelligence comes in, AI. And there's a company called Veritone that is now working with us for purpose-driven AI. I had a chance to find out about some amazing breakthrough ideas that are being done with this. And you'll want to join me as I talk with Ryan Steelberg, their CEO, and learn about how you can use audio and how it's being used today with artificial intelligence to give some serious business advantages. constantly recording and there's a lot of audio. I mean, if you've ever been over to YouTube or places like that or listen to podcasts, you know, there's really more audio than we can process as human beings. And that's where AI, artificial intelligence comes in. And there's a company that is doing some amazing things. I just heard about them, looked into it myself, and I'm amazed at what they are doing with using this to go way beyond just faster processing of the audio or to go back and transcribe it. I mean, yeah, we can do that, but a whole lot more. And matter of fact, we're going to talk to uh, Ryan Steelberg. He's joining us right now from his offices out there in California, in Orange County. And uh, he is the president of Veritone Inc. Ryan, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me, Terry. It's good to be here. I am excited when I see what you're doing. You're able to take artificial intelligence and machine learning to be able to listen to literally hundreds of thousands of hours of audio to find the right thing. Give us a, a better description of what it is that you do there at Veritone and how that can be useful in the real world. Sure. Well, we, we have you know we have a legacy problem. So there's a, been a technical debt problem that we've been sitting on tons and tons of petabytes and petabytes of audio and video going back in time with very, very little true insight into that audio and video. Meaning if you look at you know, even a YouTube video, and let's say it's a, a 10 minute segment, um, there, there is some level of metadata, like you know, the caption, who, who was producer, and, and so I would say limited information about that, but there wasn't a, a true understanding on a frame by frame, second by second basis of what's inside the content in the audio and video side. Um, so if you, if you compact that, if you look in arrears, we, that problem has already existed, and, and, and for those groups who could afford it, they would use manual efforts, and what we call logging or tagging, and they would have human beings literally listen to minute by minute or hour by hour of content and create a metadata log, somewhat analogous to when you look at baseball stats as they're produced so fast. Those today are pr primarily produced by humans watching the sporting events and keeping real-time logs of what happens. So if you think about, we've already had this problem. There's tons of content that's already been existing, with very poor resolution of indexing. Now, Compenet, what you talked about earlier in your, in your sort of intro, we are producing audio and video at a level now that just dwarfs anything in aggregate that's ever been produced in the history since the beginning of time. Couple that with the increase in bandwidth, the file sizes now of, of 4K and Ultra HD are huge. There's exactly. simply no way for, yeah, there's no way for humans to spend, have even the capacity to now sift through this tonnage that's being produced. The only way to do that is through AI and, cogn and, and I would say more programmatic cognition um, to sort of, I would say, bring organization and understanding to this chaos. I like it. I mean, I think what you're doing is breakthrough. It is nothing short of uh, brilliant because one of the things my partner and I, we watch uh, videos uh, most every night on YouTube. We like educational videos. And one of the frustrations is there's so much out there, we just can't process it all. And so you're going in there. And one of the things I found particularly interesting, you talked about using facial expressions and intonations. I've talked about this a lot in uh, programs where I speak as a professional speaker, where I say, right, let's say for a moment that uh, you and I were really good buddies. We've known each other for years. We go out drinking. We have a great time. And we're joking with each other. And I could look at you and go, Ryan, yeah, you really look great today. And by the inflection of my voice, you know, I'm poking fun at you. Versus if we type that text out, Ryan, you really looked good today on text, you don't know what it is. But I can have a completely different meaning because, hey, you and I are friends, I'm joking with you or something like that. How do you use AI to read the intonation, the facial expressions for the real meaning behind that? Uh, it, it's a great question. And I think I'll start off the question by there's not just one magical AI model. 
right? Um, you know, that, that some master PhD at MIT created to solve that problem. The answer to it is a combination. So think of it as to make an analogy is if you, if, if you are going into surgery and you have a spinal injury, you're not, if a, if, a, if a brilliant cardiovascular surgeon walks in, that might as well be worthless. I don't care how, how effective that, that, that trained and, and talented that surgeon is, if he doesn't have a practical trained understanding of the spine, then it's, it's basically irrelevant. Good so parallel to that to your, yeah, parallel to your, to your statement. I may look at your facial expression, but it's completely um, arbitrary, meaning if it's depending on culture, um, all different aspects, what you're saying versus your tone, is, is really personalized. So meaning if I took just the single AI engine that's trained to look at your face expression from let's say in the Western United States of what I think is a big smile, for example, that could have a completely different interpretation to another area um, or even a region of, of a nation or a culture. Very good so point. The, the, the way, so therefore you wanna have a platform so you don't have to create a brand new engine every time in a new technology stack is that we can see when this type of content comes in, we can programmatically train or, or what we call chain cognition. We can be able to bundle together different engines in sequence or in parallel to extract that intelligence. Meaning we don't, a lot of these um, acronyms you hear for AI solutions out there um, like Watson and other things, it's ironic that they're naming these brains one person. We have a completely different philosophy. We, we, we believe that we want to show up in, a, in effect with all the brilliant minds, not just one name. So meaning if I'm trying to solve astrophysics, I'm not going to, yes, Von Braun may be the obvious choice, but why stop at Von Braun, right? In theory, you want to bring a, a, you know, 10, 100, in theory, a million trained engines because now you can slice these problems down and you can shift it from the perspective. What are they really, what are you really looking for? Are you really looking for the facial expression as a, as a contrast to what you're saying with your words. So there's nuances there. So, so those are the subtleties that the human brain does so incredibly well and, and, and trying to simulate that or restruct that using AI trained models um, is, is what we believe our approach of um, harnessing together through what we call conductor or chain cognition is the solution. I like that, chain cognition. So what we're doing for, to go back to your example, it was a really good metaphor of the spinal operation you're going to have. You wouldn't have just a surgeon who's, one surgeon who's really good on the spine, or, and certainly you wouldn't want the cardiovascular surgeon, but you're bringing in a whole team of them so that they can say, in this area, it was that. I think uh, it sounds like you're really relying a lot on big data to pull from a lot of different areas. Well, I want to drill down to one of the things you say on your website I really like. It's like turning data into actionable intelligence. So this is an ex a subject that is exciting to me. I know to many others as well. How are your clients using this in the real world? If you can think of some case studies or ways that, hey, this sure. is something that's really amazing. What's being done with it? Well, let's, let's break it down. We have three main areas that we're really focused on and have sort of um, a lot of production clients today. Media and entertainment, legal and compliance, um, and I'll say the public sector, which is Fed and state and local law enforcement. And I'll kind of br break a few different use cases there. Same general technology stack built on what, what our technology stack we call AIware, um, but the applications of the use cases of the output of the AI are completely different. So here's a few examples. Um, CNBC is a client of ours. Um, we ingest all of their primary programming um, in real time and then we um, expose that content or in, um, in, we ingest and index it using a combination of different classes of cognition, um, OCR, NLP, face detection, and object detection. So think of these as that, and, and within each one of those general classes of, of, of cognition, we'll have multiple engines against each of those, uh, you know, um, I would say required um, uh, functions. So in, in effect, we may, without sometimes our clients even being aware, we may go from using four discrete engines to 40 discrete engines, right? Trying to optimize the output of the data. So the first part is fast, effective ingestion. So we need to get access quickly and be able to ingest the structured or unstructured audio and video, part A. Part B is then building that profile, the cognitive profile of what cognitive engine to run against it. And obviously we've gotten very good at that. But everything I just described, all we did at this point was create more data, to your point, right? The next phase when you turn it into actual intelligence is how are they applying it to the real world problems? So for CNBC, they, um, a couple of the use cases, some that I can actually talk about, because a lot of the stuff that they're seeing now, they're keeping proprietary, 
because they think of, they're coming up with their own competitive solutions on this new new technology stack. Ah, interesting. But one, it would, but one would be talent development. When I say talent development, the hosts, the people that appear on screen. Um, now, in, a, in, a, in almost a program, almost a, well, in a fully automated way, they can compile and extract all of the footage down to the second of, let's say, when Jim Cramer's face is on screen and, 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 and be able to benchmark that against ratings. So, for example, now they can look at models over time and basically say, you know what, for, you know, for in the aggregate time that Jim Cramer's on screen is four hours a week in aggregate. Um, we've seen a, a decreasing trend line of ratings associated with that exposure. And we can do that at scale, right, in a fully automated basis. Wow, that uh, is another, powerful. <laughs> uh, another example, which is, um, you know, I'd say more on the revenue side of the line, is as we all know, you know, disruptive-based ads in commercials um, have been under pressure for a while. Um, one of the um, efforts to sort of combat that is native-based advertising, right, embedding the advertising or sponsorships with and into the content. Um, the example in CNBC would be obviously um, TD Ameritrade is one of the main sponsors of Power Lunch, um, if you, and how they that, how that that sponsorship that advertisement is presented is usually in, woven into the content either through spoken word, meaning the hosts are talking about it, or you'll see objects or logos appear in the background. If you wanted to evaluate the F, the ad efficacy or effectiveness of those um, ads. You can't use, you can't evaluate it like traditional spot-based advertising where you're looking at a log file, right, from a file, uh, from, or using like a fingerprinting technology. AI, another output of how they're using it is they're now um, programmatically identifying when these objects and logos are appearing on screen. Again, how long, what's the centricity of the exposure, and again, how is that co um, comparing in terms of ratings to the, to the $150,000 for a 30-second spot they're running during commercial break. Wow, so right. that, that is powerful. I mean, that kind of thing really goes uh, quantum leap ahead of where we've been before. And I think we're only beginning with this. That uh, is powerful technology. If someone's watching this and they think, wow, I need to get some more information, we could find out about this, we might be able to do it. Of course, we've got your website there at Veritone. What's the best way for them to get in touch with you and uh, to reach you? Yeah, I mean, what we have, I mean, people are going to show up with and, and with their own problems in their minds. Um, some may show up and say, I don't know what my problems are. What can you do for me? So I think the easiest way, frankly, is to go through our funnel. We have a lot of inbound demand right now. So just, you know, sending us an email to info at baritone.com is we have a pretty efficient process to you know, process that and route it to the right people. Because how we've designed our company is if you're a media and entertainment company reaching out to us, that's going to go through a different group. Um, you know, by Drew Hillett. So we have a dedicated vertical to work with those type of companies. Um, if it's somebody from law enforcement or a bank or legal um, and, and e-discovery, we just want to make sure that we're putting that person in, you know, in touch with the right business unit so we can understand the problem intimately and be able to apply the correct solution against it. Very good. Well, Ryan, this is powerful technology, and it's something that I see a lot of applications for in what you're talking about with the media and also with law enforcement, being able to look at the legal side of it, a uh, tremendous amount of opportunity. And uh, I guess one thing before we let you go, there's also a concern that it might be a little bit creepy that uh, what if uh, this falls into the hands of the bad guys and the wrong people yep. have it? Uh, what kind of safeguards are you building into it to make sure, hey, people are using this for good uh, rather than for nefarious ends? Well, I mean, that, that's a tough problem to challenge right now. Unfortunately, you know, the, the, you know how people ultimately use these engines and the final use cases for it, um, for, in many instances, is, is really out of our hands. Um, unfortunately, you know, it's an arms race right now. Um, these technologies and, um, are out there. Um, every single walk of life and every single branch of government and all, and all different types of enterprises are investigating and using AI. Um, for either develop new products or some for some competitive advantage. Obviously, state security is a big issue. Um, you know, there's there's for, you know foreign com you know countries are heavily invested in AI. Um, the United States is heavily invested in AI. Um, so uh, you know uh, we, you know it is imperative that we don't think that this is a, an opportunity just limited again to the states and the big corporations. Right. Um, you know, th this is, uh, you know, we, we collectively as a group believe that that you know, that AI is going to be as transformative as social media or even more. Right. It's going to have a, mac a, a mega and mm -hmm. macro effect. And therefore, right, it's, in, it's imperative that we, all the way small businesses, right, all the different all nations invest in AI 
because again, they need to be part of that ecosystem. If not, it's going to be directed down um, by us and, and sort of def- the narrative is going to be defined by a very small number of individuals. Yep, I think you're right. It's kind of like technology we've seen all along. Look at drones, for example. Can be used for a lot of good. Can they be used for bad? Oh, yeah, we've seen that too. And it's like any technology right. that we have. I mean, even way, way back when Og came up with this thing called fire back in the cave. Yeah, fire can yeah. be used for good. It can be used for bad and destructive. And the key is, I think, first of all, be aware. Those of you that are watching this, this should be a wake-up call. It was for me to say, hey, this is even better than we thought, but also be aware of the potential that's out there. I think those that uh, can grasp it and start using it uh, first are the ones that are going to get ahead. Ryan, we really appreciate you taking time to be with us today and looking forward to hearing more good of what you and Veritone are doing in the future. Thank you for being here. Great. Thanks, Terry. appreciate it. And for those of you watching this, look at what has just happened. This is one you might want to go back and study. I would encourage you to go over to their website. Go to veritone.com, take a look at it, and see what's there. This is for this jaded journalist who, you know, we've been trained as journalists to go, yeah, right, Uh uh-huh. I'm looking at it going, oh, my goodness, this is amazing. And you want to get to know this, find out what it is, and think about how you could use it in what you're doing. Using video is important, and what you can do, as Ryan was saying, being able to track what's working best on TV. Hey, what about your own videos that you're putting out? What's being received well, what is not made by little facial expressions, by intonations, all of those kind of uh, areas that factor in there are something you want to be aware of. I appreciate you joining us today, and I'm Terry Brock, reporting for Business Journals and with terrybrock.com. Thanks for being here today.